And then Bill's first spelling works and invited me to participate. And I was too polite to say no thank you. And so here I am, figuring out how I might contribute to the discussion of the Peace Prize. And fortunately, last week's economic prize led right into my subject. It would appear from the research that Claudia Golden did for the economics prize that the reason that there is such a disparity between the salaries of women and men is not biological, but, surprise, but the incredible demands of childbirth and child rearing. And in the research, she showed that women who have children uh, tend to be able to, uh, tend to have less education, less, flex less flexibility, less mobility, and uh, women who have one child, who quit work for a while to have a second child, have difficulty getting back in the job market. And her studies looked at the top of the pyramid, uh, women in the higher professions, technology, medicine, uh, um, and so on. But there was no research whatsoever on women who work at Kresge's, for example, or women who work at, uh, um, in the service industries, uh, and their education and access to childcare uh, is not the same as Goldman's research. And so I looked at today's subject, the Peace Prize, I looked at one of the most important components of peace, which is equality. And if we look at most of the revolutions, including the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and uh, revolutions which uh, continue, we see that they're mostly about inequalities, whether it's the inequality of class distinction, the inequality of economic weakness, the inequalities or perceived inequalities of ethnic uh, and religious persuasions, whether it's uh, an old war that's held over from the Ottoman Empire, it is about equalities, real and perceived. And if we look at childbirth, we look at one of the biggest inequalities. Even where a woman has a child, and has some childcare and goes back to work, the woman does run something of a supermom pattern. Work during the day, race home, take over from the child sitter, uh, have quality time with the child, be there to be the perfect marriage partner, uh, and then prepare for the next day, rinse, repeat. And this puts a huge toll on women. I'm going to go back into the very distant past, into the dawn of the 70s. We're just coming into the 70s. I am a little 20-year-old recent graduate of physiotherapy, and by quite accident, I landed the job as sole charge physiotherapist at a women's hospital in Montreal. It was the Catherine Booth Hospital, and it was run by the Salvation Army, and it was for gynecology and obstetrics. And I had had my obstetric training, I knew all the facts, I'd attended births, but I had not had a child, I hadn't met David at that point, I was about to meet him and life would change, uh, but I felt that I needed to learn from the women themselves. And so for a year, I moved into the hospital residence, and I was on call whenever somebody from the childbirth classes, which I was giving, came into the hospital labor, I would be called, and I would sit with her, and I say her, not them, the man was off smoking cigars in a, a separate room. I would sit with her until an hour or so after the birth. And I learned almost everything I know about childbirth from sitting with women, from the first contraction uh, in hospital until after the birth. And at that time, what I learned did not please me at all. I 
and is giving classes in prepared childbirth, the old natural childbirth or mass childbirth or whatever, ways to help women cope with the pain of contractions. The father often wanted to help, but he was usually in the labor room. In fact, as a man said in a film that the National Film Board of Canada made with us several years later, the man said, I had done my duty, she was pregnant. And that was pretty much the end of the male role. And there was one evening which had been set up at the Catherine Booth where fathers, prospective fathers, could attend the lecture on childbirth. And I continued with this. And it featured a very vague movie. The movie showed lambs frolicking in a field and then uh, a little horse and a newborn calf and then there was a black and white shot of a woman leaning on the kitchen sink, clearly very pregnant. And then suddenly there was a christening with the baby in a long white robe. And my sense was that this really didn't portray the reality of childbirth. So I managed to get hold of a French film, which was made by Pierre Villet, who was uh, the colleague of uh, Le Mars. And the film was called La Nouvelle Génération. And it featured a full frontal birth with the uh, accompanying uh, voiceover, allez-y, 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 poussez, 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 madame. Well, it was a real hit. And at the second father's evening, there were men who weren't even accompanying the women coming to the Catherine Booth. There were couples coming from the Montreal General and the Jewish General, and it was a hit. And at one of those evenings, I said, for those of you who are taking classes in the evenings, are there any men who might like to attend the classes? Well, some brave souls put up their hands and they came to the classes. And they started coming to the classes to help their partners prepare for birth. And then my life-changing experience happened. I was with a woman one night who was giving birth and it was going beautifully. And her husband was standing in the door calling to her and she said, I want you, I want you, please come on in. And he wasn't permitted because fathers in 1970 were not permitted in the delivery room. And as I went back, after the woman had given birth to a gorgeous little girl, the father was in the waiting room and he was sobbing. And he said, I wanted to be there for my wife. I wanted to be there. And I thought, you know, why should I be there with her? He belongs more than I do. So at the next class, the Father's Evening, I said, would any of you like to be present at the birth of your child? And two hands went up out of about 50 men. And one of those men was the husband of a nurse at the Catherine Booth. And the doctor felt that this father wouldn't fall into the three fears that prevented fathers from being invited. The first was the risk of malpractice. The second was the risk of misconduct, attacking the staff. And the third was the fear of fainting. None of those things ever happened on, that I saw. And this particular man was permitted in, and I was there, and his wife gave birth to a 10 pound, four ounce uh, boy, no episiotomy, the women will understand this, and the doctor was really, really happy with the way it went because the woman was happier, the man was happy, and the doctor had more fun. That doctor had a joint affiliation with the Montreal General, and soon fathers started going to the Montreal General, and it was an idea whose time had come. But the reality of childbirth was far from ideal physiology, and my background was in physiology. Women were kept in bed throughout labor, and they dealt with the pain any way they could. Now, the physiology of the human body is such that if a woman is walking, sitting, squatting, kneeling, moving around, labor can be as much as 36% faster, shorter, which uh, reduces the need for pain and other interventions. And the normal mammalian position for birth is upright and giving birth in the squatting position. I can move away from it. 
Now, this is yeah. the, uh, what does it look like to you? It's an operating room. And this was where women gave birth at most hospitals in North America until 1976 when we did something different. And one of the things which influences childbirth and a woman's confidence and her ability to parent confidently and to go back to work confidently and to claim her place in our society is feeling confident in childbirth. And the more fearful a woman is in childbirth, the more this affects her ability to go through the experience and to parent and to take her place in our community. And nobody looking at this says warm fuzzy. Unremarkable birth. <laughs> and this was the name that the National Film Board of Canada gave to a film we made, An Unremarkable Birth. Now, David, when he looked at that film, said rather rudely, Is she giving birth to a pillar? Where is she? Uh, but this was the normal, unremarkable birth. And women didn't benefit from normal physiology, and it affected their whole approach to childbearing and parenting. And I wrote a book at that point called The Rights of the Pregnant Parent. And it seemed to me that fathers had a right to be present if they chose at the birth of their children, that mothers had a right to choose their companions and their position at birth and to do everything possible to minimize the need for interventions. And I put the book out and it became an instant bestseller in North America and Australia. Now, why would a book on childbirth become a bestseller? It's not considered a hot topic. It became a bestseller because its time had come. Women were unhappy about the types of birthing they were having. And one of the proponents of fathers in the delivery room, which was gaining uh, momentum in Montreal, was a wonderful Ontario uh, fellow, Murray Enkin, who was the head of OBGYN at McMaster. And he said, our so-called traditional childbirth practices are predicated on several fascinating myths. The first is that pregnancy is a disease. Pregnant women go to doctors. Doctors treat disease. Therefore, pregnancy is a disease. The second myth is that doctors deliver babies. Doctors don't deliver babies, women do. But when the myth is accepted, doctors feel they have to carry out their part of the contract. The doctor replaces the parents as the star in the drama of birth, and patterns of interference in birthing are inevitable. And that's what happened. The healthiest birthing system in uh, the West was Sweden. Just behind it was Holland, and I went to Holland and spent some time observing uh, at the women's main women's hospital in Amsterdam. And birth there was treated something normal. This did not happen unless there were a cesarean, which was under 4% in ca uh, cases. And in Holland, birth is treated as normal. A woman with an ordinary, uh, a normal uh, labor childbirth has a midwife and high-risk obstetrics is reserved for obstetricians. Now, next slide. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. I can do it, you know. Okay. Yeah, we'll just push it up. Okay. So what, what I decided, based on my work in Holland, was that what if we modified the physical environment so that instead of the delivery room, a woman had what essentially was a birthing motel. In the hospital, with all the high-risk 
uh, devices down the hall. And as part of that film, an unremarkable birth for the National Film Board, we called a meeting of parents and professionals in the physiotherapy school at McGill. And I talked about the birthing room. And afterwards, the head of the uh, OB unit at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal said, OK, Valme, uh, we've got two rooms at the end of the hall. We'd like to have women who are having dangerous home births come to the hospital, would you come in and set up this, what you call a birthing room? And so, we had two rooms. Which David and I set up as a bedroom and a living room. We went to Pascal's Hardware and we bought a double bed so that fathers could relax on the bed during labor instead of out there smoking cigars. We got a rocking chair, we got a hider bed which we pull out for our grandparents and sisters and so on. And it's nothing special, but it was quite different at the time and it was considered revolutionary. But it's just a pretty room at the time. Oh, there was one funny little thing. When Murray Gelfin, the head of obstetrics, was called by uh, the delivery maintenance downstairs, he said, Valme, We've got all this furniture being delivered to the hospital. What is it? I said, Murray, we've just saved you $5,000. Uh, all of this comes way under that. You don't have to buy a delivery table. And that was the end of that. So the birthing room was started. I spent the next 20 years going from hospital to hospital getting birthing rooms going. But this is just a pretty room. Let's put some people in it. Now, this was Claire and Ron, and immediately the woman chose an upright and comfortable position, and we have mother and father equally participating. Coming back to the initial premise, you may figure, I'd be going off the track with the Peace Prize. No, because peace is about equality, and the most basic inequality in our culture is in childbirth, and how much support women have in childbirth. And finally, we have a happy family with the grandmother present. She, the grandmother on the right by her, uh, the daughter's head, uh, had had four children and not been awake for any of the births. And so, We've made inroads in childbirth. Mm. Men and women are considered pretty much equal. The fathers are included. And yet in the early days, the women's movement didn't entirely want the idea. There was a magazine called Ms. Magazine, and the editor was Gloria Steinem. And she called and invited me down to New York. And I went down because of Gloria Steinem, Ms. Magazine. And we spent an hour or so talking about what was going on in childbirth. And she said, Valerie, I really like your book. We're going to review it. But we're not going to do a special on the book because the women's movement is not quite far enough along to include men. And we don't want to get into all that right now. And I could see her point, uh, although I still believe that the more involved mothers and fathers are, the more equal, the more we are likely to have peace and equality. And in every culture where there is peace, peace being defined as an absence of violence and conflict, we have equality. Uh, the, air, the countries where there is the, sh the smallest difference between salaries in women and men the Scandinavian countries, essentially, are countries where fathers participate, where there is uh, maternity leave, paternity leave, uh, free childcare from birth on. And in order to have equality, starting with the family unit and childbirth, we need to look at this before we can move out into broader peace. Now, David's going to take over with the Peace Prize for today, uh, and he's going to be talking about this year's Peace Prize, which was given to a woman who has, in a culture where women have no rights. And uh, when we look at the winner of the Peace Prize today, we think how incredibly privileged we are in Canada. 
Thank you, David. So, thank you. Uh, yes, and what significance does this have? It has significant... Can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah, for the Pierce Prize winner this time, because um, she and her husband were both radical dissidents in Iran and uh, worked together uh, and had a family. I don't know how to do this. How do we dance it to? Right, I see. Okay. So we're going back a little just to give you some detail. And incidentally, just to warn you, this is an odd, random show. Lots of funny things happen in it, partly because it's a difficult, fraught subject. So this is uh, when she was born. Born in 92, she's only 51 years old. And with the economics and literature prizes, but particularly economics, uh, peace prizes rather, age is not such a factor. And this woman, as you'll learn, has had an unbelievable life of hardship, dissidence, and working for humanity. She married in 1999 to uh, Romani, uh, Taghi Romani. He was a journalist, he's 63 now, she's 51, so it was a 12 year difference in the ages. Uh, he was a radical journalist at the time and became more so. In 2006, they had twins, and I'm almost certain that he would have attended the birth because of what happened subsequently. Uh, during this whole period, as we'll learn as we go through the various protests and so on that they led, uh, he finally was threatened with arrest. He was almost certain that he was going to be. So he took the kids and he went to France. And uh, that had tragic consequences, not for them, particularly for the man and the, and the kids, but certainly for her, because basically she only saw her kids briefly over the next 30 years. So childbirth is important. And we're starting, as I said, this we're all over the place with this, but I thought it was necessary to know a little bit more about Iran. I can say I didn't know very much. I knew it had been Persia originally, and that that was a truly significant empire. And we can see that it is. It extended, you know, almost to Greece and all the way to India, all the way north to, into the Soviet Union, around the Black Sea and so on. This was a huge empire. And that affects the consciousness, consciousness of the people. It was the Persian Empire, and we still hear about Persians and sort of thing. This is, these are great people. So this was not just some small country in the Middle East, as you all probably know, but I needed a refresher on it. Uh, one of the things that happened during the per Persian Empire, uh, we knew, or I knew, that Moses had freed the Jews from Israel, but and that was about 1300 BC. In 559 BC, Cyrus I, who was uh, head of the Persian Empire, freed the Jews from Babylon, and uh, that was and helped them build Jerusalem. So that was very significant. Again, goes back to the significance of this particular country. Oh yes, Rumi. I haven't looked at this since this morning. I've even forgotten what was going on. Just going along again with how significant the Persian Empire was and what a cultural place it was, they produced Rumi in uh, 1207. So that's, now we're out of BC, we're back into present. And I just thought he's a wonderful, wonderful poet, universally loved, and I just thought I would briefly read one of his, one of his poems. It's called The Guest House. 
This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness, some monetary awareness comes, an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently swept your house, emptied its furniture, still treat guests honorably. He may be cleaning you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them all at the door laughing. Invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from the beyond. So Rumi was truly a masterful poet. And pretty soon we'll actually get on to the Peace Prize. <laughs> okay, well, but not in a hurry. This is the Shah of Iran. A very unpleasant guy, as it turned out. Not very bright, uh, dictatorial, uh, not someone you'd like to have to dinner. And they lived it up from 41 to 1979. They met Churchill, they were lauded on the world stage, they were loved by the British, loved by the Americans, uh, but not a great re leader. And the whole time they were in power, there were demonstrations and trouble. And a lot of those demonstrations came from the clerics, from the Muslim clerics, from that side. And eventually, as you know, Khomeini, came, who was living in Paris, came to Iran and sparked the Iranian Revolution. But before he got here, this is what Tehran was like in the 60s. It was like everywhere else in the world. And a lot like America. Not the sort of image we have now of Iran under the clerics. But one thing we must recall is that in 1979, there was uh, the hostage crisis in Iran and um, the hostages got out because Canada eventually gave them passports, Canadian passports. They, they were all hiding in the Canadian embassy, got them Canadian passports and got them out of Iran using the passports. So given the story of an Iran, I just couldn't resist uh, congratulating ourselves and they were very grateful. It was a great time for Canada. Tehran is an incredible country. There are mountains in the center. This is a very long lens, but this is in 2016. It's not some backwoods uh, kind of place. And this is Tehran today. We saw it in the 60s. They or whatever it was, the bathing beauty lying back on it. Not today. But this is not, it's better today, as we'll get to in the end, than it used to be. And how can we tell? Well, this woman is in a hijab, but this woman is not. She's actually just got a kerchief on, and her hair is hanging down, and that is a relatively recent phenomenon. We'll get to that at the end. So, uh, we don't see any, any other women. I think there's another one there in her job. And they're mostly men. But this is, is, is actually progress, as we'll see. So, we're back to Iran. Uh, and it, it's important because there's, there are Persians and there are Kurds. The population of Iran is, anyone want to guess? What do you think? Good, 110? 120. I wouldn't have guessed as I wouldn't have guessed as high, but it's a, between 85 and 100. Yep. So let's say 100 million people. 10 million of them are Kurds, and then there are all these other ethnic. But the country is essentially the Persians live on this side, and the Kurds live interspersed. So that was interesting to see. So. 79, the Shah was 
deposed, in 78, the clerics began to demonstrate. And this is important for this particular story because Nargis Muhammad, her whole story is about protests. She spent nearly her whole life in and out of jail and protesting. But the first demonstrations were the clergy. And of course, they were, su they were successful. Demonstrations continued after the clergy got in. And we looked at one in 79, it was all the clergy. But by 99, 20 years later, it was the women who were in the streets. And this was their great slogan, the one that also was used by uh, uh, Mohammed. Mohammed. And here we are. Uh, this is going to be a little summary of what we'll go into in more detail as we get along. How do I get this to run? That last one is a is a video, which is quite important, and I'm not actually sure how to go back. So maybe we need the tech, the techie. I'm going to get it because we do want to show. Did it get stuck? Yeah. Yes, I need your help. Yeah. The previous slide mm -hmm. is a video. Okay. And it didn't run. Um, so we're in jail. <laughs> that was the yes, exactly. That was the slogan of the re revolution at the time. Um, Nor is going. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's not. Okay, it I might can, not have saved to the... I can run it from here. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm going to run it because I think it's important that we hear her talking. And I hope we can all hear it. basically told, tells the story that we then see unfolding here. And she went to university, she actually took physics, uh, which was surprising, and she was first arrested in 1998, uh, just after, just before those big demonstrations began, and she was one of the reasons that they did begin, because she was active in college, she was 26 years old. She was arrested, but she only spent a year in jail. And this is the other thing that, that is strange about Iran. They arrest hundreds of people, thousands of people. They murder more people in any country except China that are under arrest. Um, but being arrested, particularly as a dissident, doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to spend the whole term in jail. You may get out in a couple of years because, and that's been a pattern throughout with dissidents particularly. So she went to jail, $50,000 bail. They let her out in 2010. She was re arrested 
and she was released after a month. Mm -hmm. The next year she was arrested again, and of course she continued her activity. <coughs> there were reasons. She particularly promoted women and children, and uh, just honesty and good government. Um, so she was sentenced in July to 11 years, and in March it was reduced to six years. And the, we'll get into it a little more in the end, but the uh, people, the clerics and the elected presidents, because it has a series of presidents who are elected, they're all Muslim, had a reason, were trying to make sure that they didn't lose power, that there wasn't a full revolution. So whenever they felt the pressure build, they would let her out and let other dissidents out. Um, so she was released. There were in 2000, 2012 huge international, the Brits, uh, the U.S., uh, Doctors Without Borders. Everybody was pushing for her release, and she was released. But then she and she, she was out for a while. She was arrested again in 2015, 10 years, released in October 12. Uh, then May 21st, sentenced to two years and six months, 50 lashes and fines. She, yeah. Do you take questions, David? Sure. What does, quote, refuse to serve mean for May 2021? Oh, yes. Well, she, she was arrested and sentenced to two years, six weeks, 50 lashes. Right. She refused to go. She was supposed to report to the jail. Oh, I see. And okay. she didn't. Well. And she'd had this odd experience of getting arrested as the regime felt okay. pressures going up and down. They would, but it was interesting. It took me a while to even to get my mind around what was yeah. happening. She ultimately ended up with, in November 21, and she hasn't been released. She got, well, she has, she's short time. But she ended up with another six year sentence and uh, 204 lashes. And uh, she never talks about the lashes. But so this is where she spends, she spent a great deal of the last 30 years. In, uh, and it looks like a fairly normal building, and I guess jails too. But anyway, it's, it's where they put most of the dissidents. I would say all of the dissidents. Uh, she wrote a book. I'm not sure if she wrote the book in prison and then got it. That was the other thing. She had, didn't have a hard time getting messages out. So for example, she got a message to her daughter in Paris uh, in uh, 22, who read it on, on television in French. and. Uh, so then she published White Torture. And I thought that it was interesting. Twelve women who she'd met in even prison uh, who'd suffered from solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. And these women were incredibly badly treated. We'll get it. We'll see some of them too. Everything you can possibly imagine was done to these women. But the one that they fixed on, uh, and we'll talk about uh, Maria Amiri. Uh, was solitary confinement. Your bedrock <coughs> is the principle of social life and the solitary cell takes cells, take it away from you. So I, I found that interesting because anything that could be done to these women was done. So this is Zahari Kazimi. I've put her in, she was a photojournalist, Iranian Canadian. And uh, she was arrested in 2003 and killed, murdered in prison, never got out. And now we're going to be looking at some of the dissident women, the women dissidents. Vida Mubarshed in 2017, we're jumping ahead a little bit because she has significance. She was young, she had, that was her scarf, she took her white scarf off, stood on a rubbish tin and waved the scarf, uh, and of course she was arrested, sent to a year in prison. Uh, someone you may 
Um, well, no, well, this one was famous. Uh, I'll read a Jurvan. Jurvan was the famous one who was taken off the subway quite recently, just uh, October. Maybe it's 22. I'm sorry, I think it's October 22. And arrested. And this is a picture of her close up. Just for me. Uh, she, incidentally, was was killed in prison shortly after her arrest. They said that she had a bad fall and a concussion. And eventually, the X-rays and so on of her head came out. It was clear that she, that wasn't. Something had killed her, but someone had hit her over the head very <clears throat> hard. <clears throat> These are the hijab enforcers, and they're all over Iran, uh, and they're looking for women who don't wear their hijab. And I'm just going back to something I was going to do when we hit 1979. I'm dressed like they were, pretend I'm a woman in Iran prior to 1979. So 79 comes along and suddenly we are told that we have to wear uh, a headscarf and a full hijab. And imagine if this was, the, the men, yes, there were dissidents and so on, and they were arrested, but they never had this particular uh, thing laid on them, the dress. And the deal was that there were all kinds of things these women wanted. They wanted to be free, they wanted to be educated, they wanted rights, they wanted to walk on the streets, they wanted full Western freedoms, which they had had before. 1979. Uh, but it was difficult for the regime to rule against these things. So they kind of just fixed on this dress as a way to persecute women, separate them out from the society without having to go to a, you know, try to prove that uh, they'd done other crimes or whatever it was. It was just easy. We'll make it illegal. If you don't wear your hijab, you can be arrested. Done. Women get off the streets. So these were the type of hijab enforcers, and I'm sure they're still operating. Um, these are hijab enforcers in the horror tunnel. They set up outside, say, a subway or at an entrance to a subway, and they stand there watching for women who are not wearing the hijab. Including the one right there. <laughs> Heading in for it. Yeah. Here. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to grab her, I'll bet. Are there any, any questions? Am I, this is all a little random. We're okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Masa Gina, it's her nickname. Amini. She came from outside. She arrived in, outside, in, from the countryside. She arrived in Tehran. Uh, she was arrested because she didn't have the proper hijab, and she died a, a few months later in prison. Ivan prison. So this is uh, Elnaz Rakabi. She is a, a climber. A medalist. She has a silver. She's got three bronze, including an Olympic bronze. And as you can see, no, you can't. She's not wearing a headscarf, which was not good. Because when she got home, they destroyed her house. They didn't arrest her. She was a little bit too famous. Uh, but and here she has a hat on. She's quite defined, clearly. But they destroyed the house. 
her brother found these medals as he went through the house and as is putting them in this can, which I gather he saved them. Not a pleasant story. And there are unending pro uh, protests through this whole period. People are protesting. They're not just taking it, but and there are consequences, they're arrested, they're kept in jail, they're leaders, but they keep on going, they keep going. Uh, and both, si both sides object. This is so, Iran has two peace prizes. Um, the first one, we've, the second one we've just looked at, but Shireen Abadi, uh, got one in 2003. She's incidentally living in exile. But she was there for a while and she has truly another lifetime of resistance. Uh, she got the know how she fought for democracy and human rights, especially those of women and children. Uh, and the government called it political. So, um, and she was a legal advisor to the woman we saw earlier, the, the photojournalist who uh, died, uh, who was killed, who was the Canadian, the Canadian photojournalist. Uh, she established the Defender of Human Rights Center, and in fact, uh, Nargis Mohammadi, it was the vice president of this association, so they knew each other and worked together. Uh, in 79, as soon as the clerics got in, uh, they stopped, she was a lawyer, they stopped her practice. She couldn't practice again until 93. Now we have these two. And if, are there any Muslims here, incidentally? Because if there are, please stand up and correct me. Uh, I have some documents that support this, but I never knew the difference between Shiites and Sunnis. And I understand, and I, I think you're we're free to look at the document, that Sunnis follow uh, the words of the Prophet. So the, the words of the Prophet Muhammad sets down the rules for how you should live. And there is nothing in the words of the Prophet, which I also have here, if you'd like to look, that forbids a woman from requiring a woman to wear a hijab. In fact, it's really quite mild. And they're, they're, so it's, it's quite mild. They have to cover their cleavage, their bottoms and fronts, as Valme says, the naughty bits. That's the only requirement, according to Muhammad, for women who are Muslim. So the Shiite, don't go by the words of the prophet. They go by the words of the imams. So it's the imams who have decreed the hijab and so on. You don't see them in other Arab countries unless the imams have required them. It's not a requirement if you're a Muslim. I thought that was quite, quite interesting. Um, she won the Nobel Prize and she got a Dijon Daniel from France, rings from Greece, all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, she kept them in a safety deposit box. It was broken into an island or stolen. So Can she's. I just add something about Sunnis because in the Muhammad and the law there, women could own property far earlier in time than Western women. Oh, I'm... and they had the right to divorce too. As Sunnis, yeah. This, well, that's what I. I'm uh, sure. No, I'm sure that's true. Yeah. That's true. Mohammed is not, uh, we have the wrong impression, at least I had the wrong impression of Mohammed and what he'd written about. When you actually go to the writings, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, an enforcer of all these things. He wasn't anti-women or any of these things, but it offered something to men that men grabbed onto and used it as a way to persecute women. In fact, his wife, uh, was a widow, and she ran a business when they married her. There you go. So, 
we have their own impression sometimes. And we're, we're coming to the end here. Uh, this is uh, a time cover in 2022. And the interesting thing about it is this chart, the path. Uh, at the time, uh, in 22, the powers that be, the, Muhammad, the president and the religious director, uh, actually feeling the pressure, because we remember there have been I show a few of these protests. They're protests practically weekly, and some enormous ones where they'd have a million people in the streets. So they gradually have come to a point where they let things go a little bit. Uh, but one of and one of the things is that in downtown Tehran on a huge billboard, there's a, some, a, a slogan that says and about women. It shows women. You chart the path. So it's up, to, it's up to you, mind you. If you're wise, you won't go too far off the straight, straight and narrow. But it does show a softening in the conditions there. And here they are. Uh, Ibrahim Raisi, who is the present president, second time, and <coughs> Ali Khamenei, uh, who is the religious leader, and they call it the system. They always refer to it not as a government, the system. And general consensus is that right now, given the protests, given the fact that uh, uh, she's in jail and watched, uh, the system is on, on the back foot. Mm -hmm. Things are not as solid as they were long ago. And unfortunately, the sound is not working, but this is the laureate singing with her friend, children. Seven years ago, she was visit, she had a visit from them, so she wasn't completely cut off from her children. And this is her singing too. Well, I don't know what happened. But it doesn't matter. The last slide in the show was simply uh, her uh, singing by herself a long lament that she changed the words of to show how devoted she was to her children and her family and her husband. She's still in jail. Um, she could be re released uh, tomorrow or she could never get out. She's had enough publicity and backing from the West that they haven't killed her. It's, if you, the more you go through, the more surprised you are that she's still alive. Uh, but she is still alive. So that's it. Are there any questions? It's a slightly complicated thing to get your mind around between all the demonstrations, all the people that have been persecuted. Mm -hmm. And but I was particularly interested in the regime, regime picked this idea of the knee club simply as a simple w way to uh, discipline the entire population. Of course, the whole job of it fell on women. So I will now take off my knee <laughs> club. <laughs> Yes. David, we're all hearing about Iran nowadays, of course. Yes. In this war that's going on. Are there still protests there also now, or is it all settled? Constant protests. Constant. It's closer to collapse than it's ever been. Oh, for heaven's mm -hmm. sakes. Yeah. The country, you mean, the, mm -hmm. the system. Yes, the, the boys are, really are on their back feet. Uh, they haven't been able to really... It, power has gradually been slipping away. Mm. What's the alternative, though? Well, the girl on the car, car in 1960, I guess some people... <laughs> but look, no. there, there are no rights. Women have no rights whatsoever. So right. there's a huge 
way to go. You know. Yeah. Um, so where have their husbands been? Where have their boyfriends been? Mm. The boys have been in, in jail and protesting. This is a you know, yeah. a woman's point of view. It, it's not just the women who are right. protesting. Hmm. Uh, okay. So it's better to be a man, but if you get out of line, well, like her husband, he, he was uh, mm -hmm. he was arrested several times, and finally he just realized that uh, you know if he was going to save the kids, he had to, had to get out with the kids. <clears throat> Now they were supposedly close to collapse at least two times that I can think of. Yeah. I mean, I don't see this trajectory actually changing. Do you? I mean, what's going to well, change it? They say they have a revolutionary guard. They're very, very powerful. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't see a way of changing this. The women. Uh, this is that Time cover. There's an article in uh, 2022 at the end. And um, they, at the end of the article, it's written incidentally by a woman who is, is an Iranian and grew up there. Um, so um, What are Iranians willing to suffer in order to see their demands for fundamental change realized? The question will be resolved by Iranians themselves, those inside the country who will live with the outcome of their actions. For now, the regional and wider reverberations of Iranian girls' revolt, and they're referring to the girl on the power box with the thing in 2017, uh, could not be more seismic. In neighboring Iraq and Af Afghanistan, countries where violence against women is endemic, activists have held up posters of their Iranian sisters, which I thought was very interesting. Mm. Mm. Uh, feminists across the globe, especially in Europe and Latin America, see the outcome in Iran as a bellwether uh, for their own struggles. No one, not the officials in Iran or governments around the world, who've made hostility to women a brand of politics, saw the power of a girl standing on a utility box demanding to be left alone. So it's somewhat hopeful. Hmm. But there's a certain vested and probably widespread male resistance to this change, right? It's the same as Saudi Arabia. It, it's kind of uh, it's been going on for decades and decades, and, and there's nothing I mean, uh, what's it, going to change male attitudes? You can't be in proud of to those countries. Meeting any of this. One of the main reasons the rebellion has gone on so long is the stuttering response of government. This is, I guess, so that recognizes the validity of the complaint. They know, of course, why women are in jail. There are old revolutionary elites who have warned of assistance that is a system that has utterly lost its way, can no longer afford to subsidize its social, traditional social base, has alienated everyone else, including the religious, and has subordinated, subordinated the well-being of its citizens to the notion of security. An outside analyst might see a regime shaped by decades of international isolation. An Iranian analyst might see a narrow, brittle system desperate to cling to power at any cost. An Iranian teenage girl only sees herself as the unfortunate child of what is increasingly a pariah state, cut off from the world economically, socially, and culturally. But this will only exist as long as they've got oil reserves. I mean, once the oil reserves go, they're going to be in a very difficult position. Yes. I mean, okay. Yes. I mean, the state says the boycott that's going on, and it, it does hurt the economy. I think the country is really a horrible place uh, from anything that I've read, despite the fact that it's a very beautiful country. Um, and I do feel that from, from this, the research that I've done for this, 
that it's it's not going to go on forever. They're the trouble is, the country is now allied with China and Russia. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so and it has a border. So with where? Russia. <laughs> I don't see. Maybe. Where I this mean, is going? It's. They've got some very good universities there. Yeah. I mean, I could imagine they run, but I mean, uh, I had a very good friend, and his mother was head of a girls' school in Tehran. I mean, it was quite Western at one stage. Then the Ayatollahs came in. But I mean, they're sitting on a bundle of wealth with the oil at the moment. Yes, yes. But that was not going to last forever. Was, was her uh, focus <clears throat> exclusively the place of women, or uh, was there a number of a set of issues that she went with? Well, she was, yes, she was associated with all the issues uh -huh. we want to have. Uh, you know, not just freedom for women, but freedom for everyone, ability to go to university, oh, and clean up our own all kinds of human world. rights. Mm -hmm. uh, but because because the government focused so much on the hijab and on women, that was fe feminist in Iran finally chose that as, as where they should attack, what they should go after. I think we should watch it and we watch the country and hope that it uh, goes back to the husbands in the delivery room Decent ways of living. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I'm uh, recall when I went to I think it was Expo '67 in Montreal, and I saw the Iranian pavilion. And it, as a youngster at that time, I was just overwhelmed by how it was an edifice to the Shah. It was all about making this guy, the Shah of Iran, like seem like a superhero. And it was decadent and to the extreme. And I'm just a little kid. I'm looking at this and going, are they nuts? Well, you, you were right. They were nuts. They threw the guy out. Unfortunately, what plopped in was necessarily the best thing for the country. It's just, it's just a very odd, tragic thing to go from, yes, this, the West kind of gone wild, girls gone wild, whatever you want to call it, to boys gone wild, to suddenly overnight a uh, locked down clerical uh, way of looking at the world. And and the extremes were great on both sides. Well, it was the Brits that put, uh, put the Shah on the throne, on the peacock throne. Yes. Because yeah. of the oil. I mean, the yeah. Brits had yeah. a all yes. interest in the Iranian oil company yes. till Mr. Mutton was sadic and his pajamas went to Parliament mm -hmm. one day and said, We're going to naturalize. Yeah. But uh, it was very much to keep the, uh, and, uh, the great interest for oil. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there was a, a liberal president at one point that was deposed by America when he was starting to make a bit of progress against. Mm -hmm. yeah. against, against the show. Yeah.